All right, everybody. Hi, I'm Ashley, and uh, we're here, and we're going to um, do another panel for you guys, and I'm pleased to have actress, producer, uh, dog lover, and voiceover actress Paula Lindbergh join us today. Hi. Hi, Paula. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. How's quarantine going for you? I'm, I'm ready to move on from this phase of life. <laughs> yeah. Has uh, has quarantine stopped you from any any uh, production or filming or anything or? Yeah, there was definitely um, a lot of auditions that you know they happened and then they went away. Um, some casting directors have been good because they've done like uh, open calls. They're kind of hosting like generals almost. Like, hey, we're do all doing nothing. Let's send in some tapes. Let's you know, at least gets active with stuff. But uh, I mean, you gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah, so have you found anything that you don't normally get to enjoy because you're either filming or you're working on a project that you've gotten to really enjoy lately because of quarantine? Um, I've started to do some more renovation stuff on the house, which is good. Cause I let things just sit and you know, there'll be like no floor in the bathroom and uh, <laughs> projects get halfway done and I don't tackle them. So I've been doing a bit of that. Um, and lots of TV watching. It's good to catch up. <laughs> yeah. I know everyone's like, I'm reading and writing and doing this. And I'm like, no, I'm binge watching television. So <laughs> it's not necessarily a bad thing. It gives you, it gives you some research. That's exactly. what we'll call it. We'll call it research. Part of my job. There we go. I like that. Yeah. So uh, you are pretty well known for doing American Mary. Mm -hmm. And you worked with the Sosa sisters and you did that. Um, how did the role for Ruby Real Girl uh, come about? Did you audition? Did someone bring it to you? So, no, I, well, I didn't audition. I got a weird text that was like, hey, what are you doing next weekend? And how do you feel about wearing a latex bikini? <laughs> And I said, nothing, and I feel like I will be fasting for the rest of the week, I think was my response. Um, I don't know. I, was, I come from the house of yes. Like, I knew them. I trusted them. And I was like, yeah, I'll show up. Let's, let's see what this is all about. And uh, we sh that, that weekend, we shot the teaser for American Mary, which kind of went out to investors to help get money. And uh, we shot it in a vet's office. And... I was in makeup for like 16 hours because we had some kind of newbie prosthetic people doing it um, and not, it wasn't Todd Masters and his, his amazing team. So um, yeah, it was, it was a long day. Yeah. I, I, I've uh, listened to some of your other interviews and you said that it was like 16 hours the first day and then it was like four hours to take it off the first time. Yeah. Yeah, it was 20, 20 hours of makeup. And then like by that time, your skin is just, it's like tender. And every time someone touches you, you're like, oh. But uh, I just, got, I got through it. And then when we were actually shooting, four hours of having them put something on was like nothing. You were just like, that was easy, easy peasy. So, yeah. By the time you were done filming it, were you comfortable in the prosthetics? I don't know. I mean, I... I was comfortable with the character that it gave me, but they're never super comfortable. Like the lips kind of come off and like food gets in, you know, when you're trying to eat in the middle of the day. Right. Um, I, they're not, I admire these people who do these whole huge shoots and movies and put this on every single day. Um, it, I don't think they ever get super comfortable. Right. Yeah. Um, what was <clears throat> what was your favorite part of filming uh, uh, as Ruby Real Girl? Like, did you have a c character connection, like to her mentality, or just the idea of it in general? I I would say me and Ruby are very different. I did not. I, I liked that she was so different for me, and so for me, it was so exciting to explore someone who's made such different life choices than me and has taken this really extreme path, right? You know, this is not someone right. you meet 
maybe in Beverly Hills, but this is not someone you meet on the regular <laughs> every day and really owns her choices. And it was really fun to find those like mental jumps for me and, and how to get to that and 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 find my, my path into her. Like that's what I like to do as an actor. And so that for me was really fun. So going into that role, did you interview anybody who kind of had maybe some of the same viewpoints as Ruby or did you just kind of go into it freely and, and maybe talk to the Soska sisters about what they wanted or? I definitely uh, talked to the Soskas a lot. We talked a lot about, I didn't, I didn't talk to someone who'd done that specific um, surgery. I definitely related a lot to people who are born transgender and struggle with that transition and that like that self identity of, you know, wanting to, you don't feel right in your body and you need right. to do something to change it. You know, a lot of us are very, very lucky. We're fine with how we came out. And, right. you know, if, if you're born to take that path, that's, that's a tough journey. So I, I didn't, I didn't talk to a lot of people who had it like, who turned the, I don't, I didn't meet the person who turned herself into a Barbie. I did watch interviews with her right? and, uh, and the cat woman. I did watch the cat woman. Um, but at that time there wasn't as much online about it. So there's much more. I know that you had, yeah. I know you had said in previous interviews that, you know, body modification was, was very taboo and still kind of is taboo as far as, you know, the changing of yourself and, and the way that it comes. But at the same time, it be kind, kind of became more of the norm over um, like tattoos and things like that. So it's interesting to see the contrast of how that worked. Um, so being a part of a film that, that really portrayed a lot of that, I mean, do you feel that you guys really got the point across as far as you know, the underground world of body mod and how people were, were seeking out before it became such like a mainstream thing. Yeah, I think it definitely helped kind of shed a little bit of light. I mean, I got a lot of really amazing messages from people saying like, hey, thanks. Thanks for showing this. Like, thanks for, you know, her little speech about um, God, God chooses how she, I can't remember my lines from this long ago, you guys, but that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> It's not fair that God chooses what you look like or what whatever, but uh, how that really resonated with them and and gave them strength. And because it's hard, it's hard when you feel so different from the people around you. You're in a small town, you don't feel like you belong. And I think right. I think American Mary helped a lot of people with that. Yeah. So. You've done quite a few things, but um, a lot of people probably don't know that you were a producer on um, WIHM Blood Drive Blood Bus. How was that for you? Very stressful. being a producer compared to being an actress. It was very stressful. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I I think I was. I feel like producing is putting out fires. I feel like I was good at putting out fires. I don't know that I want to keep putting out fires. It was right. It's just a lot of wrangling and money and this and how to get this from this and make this work on that day. Um, I, I, I joke that, yeah, I, I prefer, you know, doing yoga, thinking about what my motivation is. And right. Doing hair and makeup and showing up. But uh, I wouldn't not do it again if I felt really passionate about something. Right. But uh, it's, I admire people who do that full time. It's a lot. That that's awesome. Um, do you do you know of any places where we can view that, or can we purchase it to to view it for the viewers? Uh, I think it's on the twins, um, the page, their Saskas uh, YouTube page. It was part of okay. the Women's War Month uh, Blood Drive. Okay, so it's on there um, from last year, I believe. Yeah, nice. And then you're you currently just finished uh, working on another uh, feature called Not Alone. That's it's yes. in post production right now, right? So, yeah. can you give us a little bit of insight on that one? I have a very small role in that one, so don't get too excited. But um, there are a couple of writers that I know in Los Angeles who they just write great stuff, and it's it's like a mystery, what's happening, sci-fi situation, and um, I don't know. I predict from them. There are another some some writer filmmakers who were there like. Paula, what are you doing this weekend? I'm like, I am showing up to whatever you would like me to do. I did a short, I did a short with them for like Crypt TV. 
and mm-hmm. I did full body prosthetics, like oh, the wow. whole thing, full suit. That was a lot. Um, but uh, yeah, when they're like, would you come and do this? I'm like, of course, 100%. <laughs> so we have Chris Gonzalez who said that uh, Ruby Real Girl is the best part of American Mary, Aww. that she anchors the film yeah. and shows some love. And And I can agree. I mean, I think that without some, you know, personal connection to having a, a, a specific individual in that film. I don't think the, the, it would have been as strong. I mean, Catherine does such a fantastic job as Mary in that movie, but you know, you play this abstract person as Ruby and it just brings it all full circle. You know, it just, it, you have between Ruby and Beatrice, you just have these characters that are so different, but you can you can understand their mentality and why they want to be they want to be what they consider normal and so yeah. you know it's it's I think it's kind of cool that you got to portray that so um, well, what got you go ahead was, yeah and that was in the writing too and that was like what was so nice is that they were fleshed out they weren't just caricatures you know they were right. cool people who you know they're a little part of that journey but they were fully fleshed out people instead of being made fun of, which is probably what they would experience in real life at that time, you know? Yeah. Um, so you've done a bunch of television shows as well. You've done, you know, Fringe, Supernatural, Eureka. Um, Jay asked, you know, do you prefer television or film? Oh, I, you know, it, it, it's so dependent on the set and mm-hmm. the filmmakers and what you're doing. Um, you know, that's hard. I, I think any set that includes you in part of the process is an amazing set to work on. Um, and that can happen on big television shows and that can happen on in film. Usually in film that happens more. Sometimes you go to a set and it's their set. You know, you're just showing up, you're there to do a day of work or three days of work or a week of work and you're there, fulfill your little role. Thank you, goodbye, have a nice day. Um, but when you get people like I, I, I did, um, like a lifetime movie of the week about, uh, Corey Haim and Corey Feldman and the director was so amazing about like reaching out before and talking about the character and let's do this on the day. And when you can have that collaborative process in whatever medium it is in, that's the best. So referencing um, the two Corys that you did, um, I know in, a, in another interview you had talked about how you you portrayed Judy, which was Corey Haim's mom, mm-hmm. um, and you had talked about how she kind of didn't want anything to do with the production and she was very distant, which is very understandable considering, you know, yeah. that was her son and the situation around all of that. Of course. Um, uh, after after you did that, did you ever get any feedback from her on your portrayal of her of her at, in that situation? No. So we did have there were um, members of the family and friends of the family that were reaching out to people in production uh, to express their dislike of it being made um, and that they were upset. And so we did have conversations with them. Um, and then after I did get. Uh, it was the brother of, or no, it was the bro- Corey Haim's sister's husband reached mm-hmm. out and said, I nailed his mother-in-law and I must have watched a lot of interviews. So that, that was nice and validating because she does have a very specific accent and mannerisms. And, right. and also I just wanted, like she went through this horrible thing. I in no way wanted her to be upset with my portrayal of her. You know, right. I, I just wanted to portray her as, a loving mom who who could have you're coming from small town Canada how could you have known what's yes. going on in Hollywood I learned things on that set that I had no idea were going on so I mean it was wild right yeah. well and, and I feel like maybe portraying her since she's still alive you know what I mean yeah. she's still a very live person and she has feelings and everything to 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 play her and to do her justice is it's got to be a little nerve wracking, especially the circumstances she went through. And yeah. in a sense, you're, you're kind of bringing that wound fresh again for her. So it, it's probably really good to hear from the son-in-law, you know, Corey Haim's brother-in-law that you nailed it and that you did a good job. I mean, 
that would probably be the biggest the biggest part for me. I mean, that's that's a huge feat to take on to to see this character and to portray this person that still has very raw emotion in regards to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. How how would you prepare yourself for that? I mean, I know that you watched interviews and everything, but mentality wise, as far as playing this woman who loses her son, the emotion, I mean, that's that's gotta be a hard, a hard level to reach. Yeah. I mean, I, I did as much research on her watching her as I could. Um, I think when you're just present in the moment and and if that happened to anyone, you would, your heart would bleed. You know what I mean? So right. it, um, it wasn't hard to relate to her pain because it, that was a horrendous situation. And um, also on set, you, you, you know, Feldman was there and obviously they had riffs, but you know, there were other people, managers, old agents and the stories they told, it really helped to kind of understand that world and what was going on at that time. You couldn't not get, into the meat of it, you know? Right. So we, um, we have Jill who said, um, she asked if it was available to, to view somewhere, if we can stream it or if we can Amazon it. I think it might know? be on lifetime still. Like it might be on their website to stream or I'm not sure. Okay. I know it'll come up because sometimes people will be like, I'm watching it in Hawaii right now or whatever, you know? So it does right. come we do stream it sometimes, but. Um, Paula, Drew asks, who would be your dream director to work with? Oh my God, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I don't know. Can I work with the Parasite director? I'm gonna say his name wrong if I say his name. Yeah, that, he, that movie was crazy. Um, yeah, that would probably be a good one. Who who would be an actress or actor that you would love to pair up with? Like your dream on screen partner? Oh God, I I love. I'm a sucker for like Jacqueline Phoenix just because she's so in like crazy and intense and insane, and I would love to work with him. I love oh, people awesome. who go a little wild and just really get in there and. I don't know. Someone who challenged me. Someone who was scary. I love a scary actor where you're like, I don't know what they're going to do. And I just like, like, like a method actor where they just get so far into your head and you're just like, I don't know where they're coming from or what they're going to do. Or when we are riding the ride and you're just, you have to react in the moment because they are so there and surprising to you. That's fun. I got goosebumps saying that. That's what I like. <laughs> <laughs> so that leads into my next question. Um, if there is there a current horror franchise out there that you would love to be a part of that you that you're a fan of right now? Guys, I don't know. I know they're bringing Child's Play back. Can I be in that? <laughs> um, Child's Play. There's American Horror Story. There's the Conjuring Universe, which is you know got its own crazy oh, gosh, following gosh. going on. I don't know, all those, uh, I can't do ghosts, you guys. Like, I wouldn't sleep for like months if I worked on that. <laughs> I would be a disaster. I'd be rolling in the set, just like bags under my eyes, like, <laughs> Um. So another film that you worked on was The Fiddling Horse. Yes. Um. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And, and do you know if it's available for streaming as well? It's gonna be streaming in the summer. Um, it is a story about, um, a woman who she inherits a racehorse. She's run out of money. She's losing her station in life. And she runs a con at the racetrack with an ex celebrity jockey who's played by Andy Kindler, who's hilarious. And Heather Matazzaro is in it. She's really funny. Ali Mills from the Wonder Years. Um, it was great. We got to run around Louisiana and New Orleans and it was fun. Funny. It's like a dark comedy. It's a romp. Right. So Brian has asked after voicing Marina Ismail, Ali, is it Hisaka and Sasha? Is there more voice work coming up for you in your future? I hope so. It's always hard changing cities. I really, in Vancouver, I, I was part of the voiceover community and um, they all knew me and then you moved to a larger market and it's, it was really, it's been really hard to transition that to a larger market. 
So I love doing voiceover. Right. I am back up and submitting more for voiceover. It's just, it's so competitive now. And especially because people can work from home and so many people have home studios. Like I, right. loved, I loved the days of voiceover when you went into the studio to audition and they were like, this character is sort of a chihuahua, but also a ghost. And can you make it sound like this person? Go. Like for me, that was fun and exciting. And, you, and when you're interacting, I have a hard time now because you're at home, you're in your closet with your little booth. <laughs> <laughs> is it is it more of the like self motivation? You're there. You kind of are in the feels. The atmosphere is kind of already around you. As far as like this is work. This is what you're doing. And you're and you're vibing off of other creatives when you're in the studio. And when you're right. at home and you're in a vacuum. And then you you record it like fifty million times. And you stress out about what you're. <laughs> what you're doing and you overthink it and which take and this take maybe this take what about this take oh my god this take um but no yes i would love to be back in the voiceover community if anybody in los angeles the surrounding areas would like to hire me is there is there a particular project that you would like to do voiceover work on that you've kind of had your eye on maybe ah uh, I would love to do a video game. There's, you know what, there's one that I went out for recently that um, was, looked really interesting and kind of dark. I love, I love that a lot of the voiceover now has been really uh, realistic, you know, it's less charactery for me. Um, so that would be really fun. Awesome. Um, let's see. So uh, we had another question. What was it like getting to work on the set with the Winchesters from Supernatural? So fun. It was so fun. They're such great guys. And um, it was one of my like early bookings. So I wasn't super confident on set and they were so helpful. Like, okay, Ella, if you like get down lower here and like come in at this angle, it's just going to look better on camera. And I was like, thank you. Like, I didn't know that. That's very, very useful. Right. Um, you know, I accidentally punched one of them in, in the leg and Charlie horsed him and he <laughs> was very kind about it and didn't get mad at me at all. So that was nice. And it was just super fun and lots of fart jokes and uh, just <laughs> nonsense on set. Yeah, it was good. So while you were on the set of Supernatural, did you get to witness any of Jensen Ackles karaoke behind the scenes karaoke or... I did not. I did not. I got Darn. I got to hear a lot of fart jokes though. That was <laughs> <laughs> well, I bet that was great. You know, that kind of takes them down a notch, you know. Oh, that fart was, jokes. All right. Yeah, They're pretty that, normal. That was the mood of that that week, I guess. I don't know. That <laughs> <laughs> um okay. Uh do we have any more questions? Oh, I have I, let me show my face. Oh yeah. For the American Mary. Love and I love the blood splatter behind it. Such a well uh, well done shadow box. Right? I think it just came on, it was like rolled up and I just, I, yeah, the sauce was in the It's so awesome, I love it. I just hang it up on the wall. Yeah, the sauce gave me that after and I love it. Um. So you did Fringe and it was a really great series. And our, and our, our buddy Charlie wants to know, what was your role in the series? Uh, my name was Betty Woomer and I, um, Becky Woomer, sorry. And I was obsessed with radio codes and number codes online and got super deep involved and got my memory erased. And then they are trying to figure out what, the F went on with that. So uh, yeah, I had, I got my memory erased and couldn't remember my husband and kids and they have to come in and investigate and figure out what's gone on. Nice. So Jimmy asks, what scares you the most? Um, <laughs> um, that, that, uh, Humans, no. Um, <laughs> the current state of humanity, no. Uh, I hate 
paranormal stuff. I don't, I always say I don't believe in it, but like, I can't deal. Like I can't deal with like, let's go to a haunted house, Paula. No, I don't want to. I don't want to be involved in that. I don't want to know if there's any ghosts out there. I don't want to talk to them. I don't need any of them to talk to me. That's fine. They can do their own thing. They don't need to enter my world. Um, <laughs> and serial killers. Oh, yeah. I, I love I love the very serious, you know, serial killers. Just yeah. 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 For me, it's clowns. Clowns absolutely terrify me. Yeah, I read it um, when I was young. I read it when I was like 10. Um, and that was not good for me for clowns. Yeah, you're a brave soul. I've never seen any of the it's because I just can't do it. <laughs> I, I I also have not seen the movies because like again, I read it way too young and it was upsetting. I read started reading Stephen King at like 10 for some reason. I don't know what my parents were letting me do. Um, so who were some of your acting heroes and why are they your hero? Um, I think one of my early ones was definitely Kate Blanchett. I just, I loved how she would transition from role to role and she just can morph from accent to accent and has a presence about her. She's definitely someone I've always gravitated to watching. I love Tilda Swinton. She just takes on these like different strange characters. Um, yeah. Okay. So going back to it and Stephen King and starting to read Stephen King when you were when you were like ten, what's your favorite Stephen King story? I mean, I, as much as I hate it, then I also love it, and I love Pet Cemetery. Um, Christine, I loved. Um, oh God, Thinner. I really loved Thinner for some reason. That one really got to me. Um, yeah. When I when I was younger, I was really fascinated by Misery. It was one of my absolute yeah. favorites. Yeah. Um, Kathy Bates in that movie that was a game changer for me. Um, that ankle. I, oh. I to this day I've watched that movie probably a thousand times. To this day, watching that scene where she cracks his ankles, I get full body goosebumps, and I just I feel it. I feel it in my body. And she just has such conviction in that and, and reading the book and then watching the movie really just draw me to that. And that was, that's like my all time favorite Stephen King. That I know there's awesome. a lot of greats that he has out there, but that one just, that one always sticks to me. Yeah. It was so visceral when they snapped those ankles back and you weren't expecting it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, you know, Kathy Bates does such a great job of, of portraying these really dark characters and, you know, and she was just, I don't think there could have been anybody else that could have played that role that could have just put it into the perspective that way. Because she doesn't look like someone who would be that dark character on first glance. And then she just morphs. Right. And that's what's so terrifying. Because you're like, oh my God, my little sweet neighbor next door could be a fucking lunatic. That's what's yeah. scary about it. Yeah, you're just like... um, is she hacking bodies or is she doing yard work? Cause I don't yeah. know right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, so we have another question and it says being American Mary was shot around 15 days with the fast paced film process. Was there moments of chaos that felt overwhelming? And do you have a story from the set? Um, you know, we were really, really lucky in that it was kind of hiatus time for a lot of the big shows. And so we had, stellar crew, like crew that staffs on really big TV shows. So it ran pretty smoothly and the stuff that they did in pre-production and with the DP, everybody was pretty simpatico. There wasn't a lot of chaos. I mean, it was, I mean, obviously it's like long days, but you expect that and you don't care. You're into it. You're having fun. But um, it just kind of all really came together. And, but also, too, they will hide the chaos from the actors. So we don't always know that there's chaos. Like, um, they'll tell us after the fact. You know, they sort of shield us and put us in a room over here and yell at each other in a different room. They, they like to keep us <laughs> relaxed and happy. Well, that's got to make, make for a great atmosphere to work in. Um, so Jay asks, is Flavor Flav as insane to work with as, he, as has been reported? Um, well, I don't know what's been reported. He was very nice. 
he <laughs> was definitely a character. Um, he, he was, he was, he's like a little happy puppy who comes to set every day and is so excited that he's on a set and that he's working and was just like super stoked about everything. He had his cast chair was like a pimped out pimp daddy chair with like purple <laughs> velvet and red jewels. And he was just very friendly and silly and rapped a lot in his off time. Was he like at a 10 the entire time or was he just like more low key than what you what you would be used to seeing from him? He comes in, he is, he, like every, like literally every day, he was like, whoa, guys, like we're making a show. <laughs> like, Can you believe this? It's so great. Like, whoa. There was a lot of that. You know, he did, he had like his own coat to like focus him and like help him with his lines and stuff. But uh, he's, he's loves life. He's very happy. Is what I gather. Did you, did you want to get a picture in his pimped out chair? You know, I didn't want to mess with the star of the show. I felt like he's earned that. Mm -hmm. I What have I done in my life to earn the pimped out cast chair? Nothing. I'm just going to let him. <laughs> so me. John asked, um, since doing a lot of the anime voice work, uh, were you a fan of anime beforehand? I had not seen anime beforehand. I will admit that. It was, um, I kind of fell into this. There's a studio in Vancouver that does a lot of it. And I started auditioning and that's when I was like, I gotta check this out. Like Cowboy Bebop, I think was one of the first ones I watched to really like, like what, what's, what is, what is this? I love this, this is exciting. Um, and uh, now I am, but it was new to me. I, I just, I, I came across it because of auditions, so. Um, in your voiceover work for anime, which was your favorite character to portray? I'm going to say Starship Troopers because she had this weird relationship with her father that they never addressed. <laughs> and I just was like, what is this about? Like she would <laughs> mention her father in like weird ways. There you go. That's it. So it's just because of the mysteriousness of it all behind the yeah. scenes. Yeah. That's why I liked, and I liked Marina Ishmael because she was like this princess, strong person as well yeah I'm really good with so we have it we have another uh great question for you and it says how do the soska sisters handle their direction separately uh taking different scenes or collaborating on everything i think they what i is i think is happening is they talk to each other and then one person relays i think it's usually sylvia sylvia is usually the relayer of the information but they like decide they're, they're like one brain anyway a lot of the time like I think they already know what the other one's thinking um but usually just one kind of comes in um which is good you don't want to like overwhelm right that's what I was going to ask next like does that change the dynamic on the set for you instead of having two masterminds that are trying to put a vision together and you know they're they're coming together and just bringing you one person with one focus and and it's very much agreed upon you know, instead of the back and forth. I'm sure they fight about stuff behind the scenes. Like, and I, that's, you know, right. the, the directors usually, you know, you, you do want to keep your actor a little insulated from that. You don't want to be like, maybe it's this way or this way, because then our brain is jumping around and you're going to get a really scattered performance. So no, they, they tend to, I mean, they're so enmeshed that they, they've talked so much, even it takes so long to get a movie made. They know what they want. They know what their vision is before they even get there. Right. And so they're right. pretty clean and clear. And a lot of it for me was talked about beforehand because we did the teaser together. We were in communication beforehand. So set was pretty easy, easy peasy. Right. So on all of the different sets that you've been a part of and the filming roles that you've been a part of, is there, besides your face, uh, your prosthetic face from American Mary, is there another prop or piece of the film that you brought home with you that's special to you? Um, 
I've accidentally taken wardrobe home. <laughs> I don't have a lot of stuff. This is like one of my only things that I actually have from shooting. Um, you're not allowed to take things a lot of the time. That's the problem. <laughs> I don't have a lot of knickknacks from stuff from shoots, unfortunately. Is there something from a shoot that you wish that you could have kept on to that like helped that was like a favorite piece of yours to work with or prop or anything of that sort? Oh man. I wish I could have kept my supernatural teeth. Because they um they mold them, like they do like a really nice cast of your teeth. And I wish I could have kept right. them. Even great for like Halloween. They were a little bit different than a vampire. They were a vetla, so that would have been really nice to have on hand. So we have we have another question, and it, um, it's Charlie, and he says he already thinks he knows the answer, but his wife wants to know if Jensen Ackles is as dreamy as she thinks he is. Yes, yes. <laughs> I got in trouble uh, on set um, when he was killing me because I was, it, I didn't look afraid and the director was like, Voila, it, is not a, it is not a sex scene, it is a murder scene. <laughs> <laughs> He's just so dreamy that you're just like captivated. They both are, they both are and they're tall and a lot of male actors are not tall and they're just like, oh. they're very dreamy, yes. They've got the, the thing, they've got the it whatever, you know, they, they have that it factor. Yeah. So we have a, we have a good question for you. Are you team Dean or are you team Sam? Sam. <laughs> she said, Oh, all day team Sam. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't even hesitate on that one. She was like, Sam, of course. <laughs> when you know, you know. So do you have any upcoming projects that are coming about that we should know about? Uh, just the Fiddling Horse that's coming out in the summer. Um, with that director, I might be doing another project coming up, but it's not solidified yet because everything's all right. Um, yeah, that's about it, guys. Yeah, that's about it. Kind of a weird Did time. you ever find yourself, did you ever think when you were younger, like I know that you've done dance and some performing arts and stuff like that growing up. Um, did you ever think that you would be in like horror films or television shows portraying uh, some of these characters? I mean, no, but I hoped I would. When I, when I was actually in high school, we actually got to tour one of the big studios in Vancouver and they were shooting and we got to go on the set and look around and I was like this. I'm like, wait a second, like I can live in a fake house that's inside of a soundstage and pretend, make play make believe this. This is exactly what I wanna do and uh, sign me up. So we have a question from Chelsea and it says, what would be your dream role in a reboot of a classic horror film? Oh my God. Guys, I wanna do, can, we, can I do The Shining again? <laughs> can I do The Shining? <laughs> That would be fun. What what part would you like to play? The woman. Why am I blanking on her name? Shelly Duvall. Duval. Sorry, my husband. <laughs> Shelly. I'm That's horrible. okay. Um, Shelly Duvall. I know I don't look like Shelly Duvall. I'm sorry. Um, That's I would okay. also. I would love to be the bride of Chucky for some reason. Um, I would also love to be Charlize Theron in Monster. Ooh, it's not a horror great movie. movie. But that would be so fun. Such a such a contrast from like what she normally does to that just hard character that she played in that. Yeah. Um, so we have another question for you, and it says, "Being a part of the horror community, has anyone shown you a tattoo of you?" No, I've seen tattoo of my lines on someone, but I never never of me. No. Does do you have one? Show it to me. <laughs> <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll seek one out for you. Um, do you, do you get a lot of like fan art, um, and stuff like that? Like, have you gotten some really cool I have, fan yeah. art? I have some paintings of Ruby. I have some, uh, knickknacks, like, uh, made things of her. 
Um, yeah, it's awesome. It's cool. Like, it's so, it's so amazing. And then we had a question earlier that asked, uh, what's it like doing the supernatural conventions? I've never done one. You haven't done one yet? No. Oh, we need to get them on that. Come on. Ask them. No, I have a friend who does a lot of them and she loves it. She says they're so fun because they usually do like karaoke night and like games and she loves them. She That's says awesome. Yeah. Um, so we, ha we have another question that says, uh, what Stephen King movie would you want to do? Oh my God. You guys are making me use my brain today. It's not firing on all cylinders. Um, I mean, no one could replace Kathy Bates. No. That would be an amazing character to attempt. Um, I want to do Pet Cemetery with all the creepy little animals. Nice. Um, so we have another question that says, what was your most awkward moment with a famous person? Probably punching the supernatural guys on set. That was bad. <laughs> Was it awkward or was it just like, oh, okay, like. It was awkward for me. Um, oh God. Oh, you know what? I actually had an awkward moment on Fringe too with, um, what's the main guy's name? John Noble. Not John Noble, the hot one. John Noble. Oh, oh. Um, I, uh, I was photo doubling for Anna Tor and mm -hmm. I'd give, been given instructions, but then like, so he, they're shooting his coverage. I basically wrecked his coverage. And he was like, really not pleased with me. Um, so we have another question. Did you know any of the mythology of El Kukui before being a part of the film? I did. I researched it because I have to know everything before I do something. Um, and it was really fascinating. And I loved that they were exploring a different culture's boogeyman. It was cool. And that they had this like young deaf girl. The director is deaf actually. And so I thought it was really sweet that they had the protagonist be deaf. It was yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so with that, you know, that that kind of falls in the lines of La Llorona that just recently came out as well. So have you seen that one yet? No, no. Oh, you that one's really good too, as far as like the the folklore of, of another culture's boogeyman or or um what are they called? Um yeah, more like their mythology or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that it's it's kind of cool to see, you know, that so many little kids are grow up believing in El Kukui or La Llorona and, and, and how that affects them just in their normal lives. Yes. And then you have these movies that are just so intense. Well, and it's like people, parents do it in other ways too, like with Santa Claus. Like you're not going to get your presents if you're not, you know, but then I have an element of, total fear into the child's life. I mean, that would have been traumatizing for me. <laughs> My dad told me every lake had the Loch Ness in it and I am terrified of seaweed now, so. <laughs> you just, did he, did he ever just drill it into you enough to where you just had like vision being out at the lake and you see like, you're like, oh, there's the Loch Ness like popping yes. up out of the lake. Like he'd point at a log and be like, look, look, look at, look over there. <laughs> I'm surprised that's not what you're most afraid of because <laughs> he just drilled it into you. Yeah, no, I don't love swimming in lakes. Ocean, fine. It's weird, right? It's backwards. Uh, I think more of it's that murky, you know, you kind of get more of that dirty murky look in the lake, whereas the ocean is just the ocean. It's big yeah. and vast and, yes. you know, yes. but the lakes are contained and it's, you know, they're, they're pretty big. Some of them are pretty big, but they're, get that that small feeling and you're just like I don't know what's in here <laughs> well there's so much mythology about weird lake creatures that we don't know of and yeah yes let's let's do movies on that yes yes exactly <laughs> see look you could do a Loch Ness movie you could be a producer on it I could I could bring your fear in I could yeah I could also just be crying on camera a lot if you want to be <laughs> <laughs> um is is there is there a particular country that you would like to film in that you haven't had the chance to film in yet? Oh my god, every country. That's I think that would be amazing. 
I would love to be somewhere with old, big old castles and crumbling buildings and that would be amazing. I think it'd be fun to film in Europe with all the history and that would be fabulous. Um, anywhere, anytime you get to travel for work is a blessing, I think. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, so one last question before we close it up. What's your favorite classic monster movie? I, I love, um, Muffin, why am I blanking on what we just saw? Mm -hmm. No! <laughs> oh my God, you guys, I can't think of what I'm thinking of. Invisible Man, Frankenstein, oh, Creature. No. no, bigger. Bigger. Jackson's. Godzilla. Godzilla! Oh. How can I not remember that name? He's right behind me. Oh my God. <laughs> nice. It's my husband's favorite is Godzilla. He absolutely loves Godzilla. My brain is atrophying in this point. <laughs> That's what's happening. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank you, Paula, for coming in and doing this. I hope that, and you know, everything goes well and you have safe travels back to Canada for your, oh. your little adventure. And thank you for your time today. Thank you for all the great questions and thanks for whoever watched. Yeah. Thanks everybody for tuning in and we will, uh, we'll see you guys later.